What is up, Bitcoiners? It's your boy CK, and this is another episode of the Bitcoin Magazine podcast. This week is actually not me. It is my man, Pete Rizzo, the guy who dug deep into Satoshi's history, into the history of Bitcoin, and put together an absolutely fantastic deep dive research piece into the last days of Satoshi. This week, Pete Rizzo sits down with Dr. Adam Back, the founder of Blockstream, an early cryptographer and cypherpunk who created the very foundation of what we now know as Bitcoin proof of work. Um, Adam and Pete, they they talk about like who Satoshi was. Did Adam actually go deep into Satoshi's writing? Is it even important? And they just talk about everything there is to talk about when it comes to Satoshi's legacy and whether Satoshi will be known and how he'll be known into the future. I think you guys are really going to love this podcast. But before we get into the interview, let's talk about Bitcoin 2021. Come on. This is the number one event in the entire space. This is the biggest Bitcoin event in history that's already done and paid for. There is no competition whatsoever. And oh my God, the team has done such a fantastic job of assembling a fantastic speaker list of assembling some of the biggest names in the Bitcoin space. Michael Saylor, Cynthia Lummis, um, Jack Dorsey, Warren Davidson. Uh, there are several key politicians in the Bitcoin space that are pushing Bitcoin forward from a political perspective that will be at this event and several other movers and shakers, Jack Mahler's, um, Anthony Scaramucci, so many more, so many more. You guys are absolutely going to love this event. You guys are absolutely going to love being in the Bitcoin takeover of Miami. Bitcoiners will be putting on such an amazing and huge presence in the in the city of Miami and man. I am so excited to just be there basking in the sunlight and basking in the optimism that is Bitcoin. So y'all go to b.tc forward slash conference. Go check out all the speakers. Go check out all the sponsors. Check out Whale Day. Check out everything, man. There is so much going on. Check out the satellite events. There are already 20 or 30 satellite events on the website. And go get your ticket. You can save 10% off your ticket with promo code Satoshi. But you can actually save even more if you pay with Bitcoin. You can save $400 off of your GA ticket if you pay with Bitcoin. And our next sponsor, MoonPay, is making it super, super easy to use their little widget on our website to lock in that $400 savings. And they're going to even give you that Bitcoin buy so you can make the purchase completely for free. They are not taking a commission there. So you can lock in a $400 savings using MoonPay to buy a Bitcoin 2021 ticket with Bitcoin and ultimately by swiping your credit card on the MoonPay widget. MoonPay is a financial technology company that builds payment infrastructure for Bitcoin. They are on and off ramps that seamlessly integrate fiat and Bitcoin into all major payment processors, including your debit card, credit card, Apple Pay, Google Pay, Samsung Pay, you name it. It's on Moon Pay. So, uh, you know, check it out on our website. You can also check it out in your favorite wallet. It's in 300 plus wallets. They make it so that way you can just buy Bitcoin with Moon Pay, get it sent to you strictly non-custodially on your non-custodial wallet. Way, way better than Coinbase or something like that that's custodial. And they're in 160 countries. So, y'all. MoonPay, they are doing really epic stuff. Check out the little product experience on B.TC. Save yourself $400, $400 worth of Satoshis that could be saved by paying in Bitcoin and using your debit card to do so with MoonPay. So y'all, check out this podcast with Adam Back and the man Pete Rizzo. And uh, yeah, I'll see you next week. Peace. Welcome back to the special edition Bitcoin Magazine live stream. I'm Pete Rizzo, editor at Bitcoin Magazine, editor at large at the Kraken Cryptocurrency Exchange. We're here celebrating Satoshi Disappear Day, reviving a holiday once proclaimed on Bitcoin talk forums as a date for honoring uh, Bitcoin's then absent inventor, uh, Mr. Satoshi Nakamoto, or... Uh, maybe no mister on that. We, we, we might never know. Uh, for our next panel, we have uh, Dr. Adam Back joining us, the renowned cryptographer and cypherpunk cited in the Bitcoin white paper by Satoshi themselves. Uh, also CEO of Blockstream, a leading Bitcoin infrastructure company. Adam, it's good to see you again. Hi, good for having me on. 
Awesome. Well, uh, let's dive in. So we're talking about Satoshi. We're talking about uh, his legacy and impact um, as, a, as a software developer. Obviously, you know, uh, the Bitcoin project is what we know it is today uh, uh, from that individual and or group or whatever we know about them. Uh, you're on the record as having emailed uh, Satoshi in August of 2008 before the release of the Bitcoin white paper. But uh I guess I'm just curious, uh, you know, to hear your perspective and 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 get your take on. Obviously, no, you're not an active developer, but you know, I know that you spend a lot of time with developers and in development circles. Uh, so, curious to get your thoughts on, you know, uh, just what the state of thinking about Satoshi is today. Whether he is someone developers actively think about, uh, you know, whether he still has an impact on the project, and if so, how. So, I guess I'll start there. Maybe you can give us a window into. You know, how much of Satoshi's writing have you read personally? Is it something that you read regularly? Uh, maybe give us your take on on what your your thoughts are about Satoshi's body of work. Um, yeah, so I, you know, when I got more actively involved in Bitcoin, which was uh, 2013, I did the uh, thing that people do, get down the rabbit hole, realize there's a lot more. It goes much deeper than you thought. Read everything you can find. And so what I actually did is I went on a Bitcoin talk forum and I read, I just sorted by post by so you can click on the author, click on the post, sort it by date, just read it beginning uh-huh. to end. So uh-huh. actually, yeah, I read them all. <laughs> and uh, huh. you know, people like to quote them, but I think that it's actually not that constructive because people should think for themselves. And I think, you know, some I, I'm supposing that understanding has improved because, you know, sort of minor design defects were fixed, like a transaction malleability. Um, and typically, uh, the market kind of tells you what, what something's use cases are. And so that's probably evolved over time. So I think Bitcoin just has to optimize for you know, what people want to use it for. Yeah, so obviously you're a technical person, so it sounds like you read the writings. You just went straight through. Uh, you know, did you have any impressions? Did you take notes, or what was your reaction? Uh, did you have a sense that this was something that uh, you were trying to kind of find the lost treasure of, like something that he left behind, or was it more you were just kind of interested in what he thought? And I guess maybe just tell us, like, how did you leave that experience? Well, I um, I when I get sort of dig into a new bit of technology. I will try to absorb it all so that I feel like I understand enough to contribute rather than kind of scratching around with a half understanding. So uh, as an example, when I was uh, doing my PhD, I did some programming on a transputer network. So I got the reference manual for the CPU architecture and read it end to end. So I was like, okay, I know how this architecture works now. Maybe I can do something with it. So it's kind of that sort of thinking, well, you know, there's a there's a high level understanding. That's one of the nice things about Bitcoin, actually, that you can understand it and get a useful understanding of it at, at a high level, at lower level, lower level, lower level. And so, I just wanted to get down to the bottom. And at that time, there was not that much uh, written about the bottom. So one thing I found was a guide by somebody who'd done a code walkthrough and told you what all the modules do. And then I basically ran out of things to read. So I figured, well, there are people coding on this. So let's go find where they're hanging out and talking about, you know, how to improve it, what comes next. And that turned out to be the Bitcoin Wizards IRC channel. So then I went on Mm -hmm. there and peppered the uh, frequent developers with questions and they patiently answered and fixed my misconceptions. So Mm -hmm. that was uh, very helpful. If you're a new developer today, do you think it's important for people to read Satoshi's writings? Um, I think there's probably more kind of condensed, accessible information now. Um, but yeah, his, you know, as recollecting from reading them, they are quite concise and to the point. You know, there's there's not much kind of socializing and chit chat. It just looks like straight to the point. But this is why that might be a bad idea. And some of it, you know, is like reacting to new things that arose or ideas that people had so that's a good idea or a bad idea or bouncing off things if you look at them um i'm not not a fan of the uh, quoting satoshi like satoshi said this or that that gets into the you know well it should work this way because the original author uh once said this because then you get into interpretation right and there's so, so many posts that they're usually things that contradict each other too so you can like 
pull up quotes that say the opposite. Um, uh -huh. So it's more important, I think, for people to, you know, form an opinion about what's important about Bitcoin, what what things the market values that the users value that are differentiated in a market sense, right? You know, it's going to be difficult to cheat, compete with cheapness, let's say, because there's something hard to scale and moderately expensive about global broadcast transactions, but that's the cost of, you know, permissionless censorship resistance and seizability. And so, you know, that, that in itself was a, a cause of much discussion in the past. And so I think people need to form their own opinion about what's differentiated and valuable about Bitcoin. And of course, different people have different views. You know, there are many different interesting properties of Bitcoin, so different people value mm. them right. differently. Right, yeah, I guess that's a good point to think about. You know, there's the technology part, there's the economics part, and then there's the goal and the intent, right? And I think when I think about Bitcoin, there is the there's this stated intent of the system. There's this, you know, drive that the system gets. Um, I mean, obviously, I mean, you would say that that is from Satoshi, right? That the that the driving kind of design goal of the project and and where it's heading. Uh, you would you say it's fair to say that's something that he contributed? Um. Or he or they? I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, some people would say that it, it hasn't really changed, but um, clearly there's an investment part of it, a store of value part of it that has become bigger over time. Because originally it like, barely had a price, right? People were trading them mm -hmm. for amusement value, buying pizzas for today a billion dollars or whatever it is. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that you can see even in the white paper that there are concepts there, you know, that it's direct payment, there's no intermediary, and that it's cash-like, which I take to mean bearer. Uh, and um, so there are very few bearer things in the world, especially electronic, right? So it's kind of the first um, very survivable because it's decentralized um, bearer digital asset that has held a you know a, a tradable price so that's that's very interesting i mean there were there were certainly projects that tried to do that before um but they kind of failed for various reasons i mean centralization being primary one so Mm. When, I guess when you think of uh, Satoshi's writings today, so is it, so it sounds like you you mainly derived a technical understanding from them. You were trying to use them for the utility of okay, I want to understand what it is this thing does. You were not. It doesn't sound like too concerned uh, with what he wanted or how he might have thought the network should be built. Um, well, I, th I think you know some aspects of a Bitcoin like design had been thought about from like 97, 1998, uh, with Hashcash, Bitgold, and B-Money. And you saw many of the ingredients in there, the realization that it has to be decentralized, that it would be broadcast, that you needed Byzantine General's uh, solution to that problem. Even smart contracts were, um, you know, before Hashcash even, right? And so um, there, was, there was some missing pieces. And so it is curious, you know, what the extra insight was that triggered, you know, that enabled him to fill in the gap that, that made it not quite buildable or not quite decentralized with some of these designs that were sort of super nodes with humans operating policy decisions and a market mm -hmm. in, in like Bitgold and B-Money. And mm -hmm. Bitcoin solves it in a fully decentralized way, which takes any kind of human policy out of it, which I think is important. Do you think Satoshi had an idea, a definition of decentralization? Did he define it at any point that, that you know of, or did you take away from his writings that there was a there was a definition of, of what was trying to be achieved, or was it priorly uh, known? I'm, I'm just curious what your thoughts are on 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 the specific aspect of it being decentralized. Um, probably it's uh, something in the paper, I would imagine, um, and I think there are probably some quotes about not having the network get too heavy, or it would be difficult for people to self-verify. Right. Um, I mean, in a sense, I think of the decentralization as a mechanism to achieve an effect. The effect you want is a couple of things. You want it to be survivable so that if any you know, individuals and businesses come and go over time, the network keeps running, it's redundant. So it's sort of redundancy so that individual things can fail or lose network connectivity. 
And um, the second thing is um, permissionless, so that you know if if one entity decides they're going to try and selectively uh, censor transactions, it won't generally work because there are lots of entities, and the entities are uh, at least yeah. by design anonymous. So you get you get both of those effects, but you know those effects in the future might be achievable with different technology. Like for for right now, with the computer science building blocks that are available. It seems to be about as good as you can get, and as a common cause of misunderstanding, people will say, "Well, you know that that was the MySpace we're building, you know, the new thing," and like typically, I would say, "No, they're not," um, and that's a surprising effect. I think it comes from Bitcoin's design space being, you know, very narrow design space that only just works, and so most things a little distance away from it are actually worse, like more complicated, less efficient, less reliable easier to sensor, that kind of thing. So it's actually a really difficult design to to improve. And most of the optim most of the changes have been kind of optimizations at, at lower level, like network optimizations, code optimizations, but nothing really that significantly changed the base design. And I haven't really seen anything yeah. in, you know, altcoin land that has appreciably, you know, improved any any particular metric, or at least not without making other things worse in a way yeah. that Made the net system worse. One of the things I was really struck by, I guess, by by sitting with the thought processors thinking about Satoshi is is just that um, you know I, I feel like there's a kind of an inherent contradiction in Satoshi. It's like he, you know potentially he might be a single person who invented a decentralized money. <laughs> so then the question sort of becomes like, okay, well. Uh, at at the start, like Bitcoin couldn't have actually been decentralized, right? Maybe I would make that claim. Like I don't like like if you're a single person who invented decentralized money, it's it's all it's almost contradictory. So I guess do you have a sense of like when Bitcoin became decentralized to you? Is there a point where uh, was it just another person on the network, or was there sign is, is there some sliding scale that, that you would say that it passed that threshold? Well, I mean, I guess you need you know a good some some reasonable degree of redundancy for it to survive. I mean, to continue to peer-to-peer -peer pass messages and to mine blocks. I mean, so there's presumably a period in the first, I don't know, three months or something where that was uh, a bit erratic, let's say, you know, like the hash rate might have been going <laughs> down and stuff like that. So, but um, you know, there were there were a lot of participants. I mean, people will make claims about uh, transaction patterns and guess who owns them. But, you know, realistically, even if you take the most optimistic of those, there were clearly thousands of miners, even in uh, 2009. Um, huh. So, uh, yeah, that, that was like effectively reasonably decentralized, I would think. And of course, the Pitspin network is a bit hard to fully measure because not all of the nodes are reachable. And so it looks like based on heuristics that Maybe the networks are ten times bigger than what you can see in a direct way. I also want to talk a little bit about Satoshi's authority, right? That's something I think that um, you know, in the piece I recently worked on, that that really kind of comes up in the beginning. You know, Satoshi is sort of the alpha and the omega. He's the website admin. He's the head of the forums. Uh, he's the lead developer. Uh, you know, he has all these kind of vestiges of authority. Um, I guess you know, maybe can you talk a little bit about why there's a bit of a aversion in the Bitcoin development community to talking about Satoshi, and uh, maybe uh, just kind of explain where that comes from. Um. So I think uh, people are generally of the opinion that it's better that you know it's it's a good thing that Satoshi left uh, is not is not actively involved or if he's involved it's under some other uh, you know contributor GitHub name or email address or what have you and um, and and that it could be dangerous for somebody to be appearing to be in centralized control so a lot of um, mainstream media and, and people out, out in the world think in hierarchical mindsets that they they think well who's in charge and then they want to influence the person that's in charge and even if that person doesn't in fact have you know much influence that's still potentially problematic um so i think you know i've, I've said before that if if i you know came across an email that was linked to satoshi that had ip addresses in it or something like that i'd be inclined to delete it uh, just because it's it's better to to not know, and I think his intent was clear, right? He decided to leave, so we shouldn't try to undo that. Um, and I think that's actually good for 
uh, Bitcoin as a um, technology that it it therefore feels more like a commodity, um, a discovery, like gold was discovered, rather than a piece of technology, a technology product with a project with a leader. And so, you know, and, and in fact, that's that's also a common understanding to, misunderstanding today, even that developers, you know, might have some influence or that miners might have influence and so on. And I think that past events have shown that actually the market has much more influence than people thought it did. So that, you know, there's there's not really much in the way of automated software updates. So developers could, you know, write a client potentially did something that the user didn't agree with. And then they would, you know, some other developers would make a client the user did agree with and the users would choose what to run. And that right. actually kind of happened during the 2017 activation. There was a you know, interim client that mm. solved a particular problem, uh, which was actually put forward by another pseudonymous developer, Shailen Fry, right? So um, that shows that, you know, both the miners are not in control, developers are not in control, and ultimately the market will resolve these things, at mm. least then. Do you get a sense, like, have you thought about, um, you know, so obviously, you know, Satoshi, you know, leaves, he, he signs off on the software, he changes over the copyright statements, and and other developers kind of step up and and, and uh, kind of move into that space and, and try to follow in Satoshi's, in Satoshi's wake. Do you get a sense of how much you think they followed and tried to emulate what Satoshi was doing, or do you think they took it in their own direction? I guess, what is your sense for the people who's, you know, obviously you weren't uh, back involved with the project in until 2013. The project still, you know, had a strong kind of leadership at that point. Uh, how do you look back at that time? Do you, what do you think about the people who kind of followed Satoshi and 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 the decisions that they made? Yeah, I mean, I think people looking at at, at Bitcoin, you know, from the outside as they become familiar with how it works, are often confused about you know, how a piece of software can enforce something. And, you know, what if the developers could change it? What if the miners could change it? And in practice, um, I forget who said this, but somebody made the analogy that it's like the game of chess. I think it's plan B, actually. So, you know, if people are playing chess and somebody says, well, I'm going to change the rules, you know, the, oh, the knights are going to move it this way. And it, it won't change the game of chess. It doesn't really matter who they are because that's not chess anymore and people won't use it. So it's really whether there's, you know, mass adoption of a change. And so, and there's another factor, which is that developers are, you know, trying to, I mean, there's actually some kind of uh, contract in effect, right? As a social contract and understanding of what are the immutable aspects of Bitcoin. And so most of the development of Bitcoin is actually, you know, it's not, it's, there would be no intent to ever change these immutable things. And so the changes are opt-in, backwards compatible, and you know, they, either, they either add opt-in features or they optimize existing features like resource usage, efficiency, that kind of thing. So there's not really any discretionary, you know, should we change this? Should we change that? Should we change the economics? Like that, that is out of bounds and people know to not even propose it. But if somebody did propose it, you know, that would be immediate, you know, immediately rejected by everybody everywhere. Mm. I mean, like other developers, uh, other software packages, wallets, businesses, investors, everybody would reject it. So, you know, the the rules of the game, the kind of uh, physics of the digital commodity are immutable as a result. And that's, that's a kind of um, counterintuitive thing, given that it's a piece of software that, you know, lives out in the, on the internet. Mm. I guess maybe I'd say this, uh, you know, uh, drawing again on the research here, you know, with Satoshi, he, he did make some moves unilaterally, right? So he did decide to make some changes to the software, and then he coded that piece of software, and then he pushed that to the users, right? That is, uh, he did accept, you know, people emailing him and sending bug fixes, and he did accept, you know, contributions in that sense. But, uh, you know, in, in, in other sense, you know, he was able to and did kind of take advantage of his position in the project as, you know, the person who was able to kind of best secure it or best be the steward of it at this at that time. Right. That's not the case today. Uh, what is your, how would you describe to someone who's new, like why that change occurred? Well, I think the network is a lot smaller. It was easier to 
reach people who are running a node. There were less businesses with software inertia and systems upgrade. So, and, and the software was less reliable. So uh, I think he would literally have been fixing bugs that would have caused problems. And it was also sort of less carefully upgraded. So pieces of network infrastructure are pretty rigorously tested and deployed. You know, So if a Cisco router upgrade is done, they're going to you know, run a test suite that's a foot thick of documentation before they ship any of those. And they're going to be standing by ready to you know, try and fix it or roll it back if it goes wrong. And so Bitcoin has a lot of uh, mission critical thinking behind it nowadays and a lot more rigorous testing. And these kind of, you know, hey, I've uh, fixed a bug, upgrade this uh, on the IRC <laughs> right. channel or, or, right. or a mailing list or something. Is that, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't work anymore. It would be risky uh, where, it, where it was not so risky. And also there was less money at, at stake at that time, right? Because uh, maybe there wasn't really a price. Um, right. Yeah. Do you th- do you get the sense that you know he was doing the best that he could with the with the tools that he had, and and I think maybe given a different larger environment, he would have operated differently. Or that's maybe you don't know specifically there, but um, you know, I guess uh, I guess is that your understanding? Would you try to be sympathetic to him at all, or or, or I guess did you have you thought at all about about his actions and 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 what they mean? I guess as somebody who would have made them. I mean, in terms of quality assurance and you know, care of upgrades, I think there's a time and a place, right? So because it was early, it's probably more important to you know, take user feedback and fix bugs quickly. Um, but I, I also think that the, you know, my understanding from talking to developers of being involved across different periods, that um, the general sort of defensive testing, the quality assurance level, the review of line by line of changes, the amount of fuzz testing, you know, that has just notched up and up and up over time uh, to the point that it's arguably the most you know, heaviest uh, quality assurance piece of software on the planet, uh, beyond a flight control system of a, a jet or something. Um, hmm. So, so you I think, think if Satoshi came improved. back today, he wouldn't, he wouldn't maybe even be able to get his contributions in the Bitcoin? Well, that's an interesting <laughs> thought. It, it, might, it might get some peer review, yeah, as possible. Hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, also I, people have hmm. different, you know, specializations, right? So some people are interested in protocols and some people are interested in like precision quality engineering. And those are not always the same people. So, you know, Satoshi clearly had enough of both to pull it off, but there are, there might, you know, for any given person, there's probably somebody who is better at you know, precision engineering, let's say. And there are certainly some, you know, world-class developers doing some very careful, carefully engineered and thought through uh, protocol upgrades and code quality work these days. Does authority exist in Bitcoin development today? Um, Not really, I would say. I think that there are bits of process that people who are not, you know, familiar with the low level aspects of how you know an open source project is is managed might find un- unintuitive but but basically you know i mean there, there's a binary but the binary has been compiled independently by multiple people and signed so that's to make sure that the binary matches the code and then there's a, a source code repository but again multiple people are checking it and it's not an authority right so if you know if they lost control like if if uh, the provider of the repository decided they weren't going to support open source projects anymore, I mean, we just move to another open source repository, right? If something went wrong in terms of, you know, uh, disagreement about a maintainer, so the maintainers, there are multiple maintainers, but the maintainer's job is basically to do some kind of housekeeping, right? See, see what other people have passed QA on and have consensus, like technical consensus to, to improve non-consensus non-network consensus code upgrades um, and then apply them, right? So if that, you know, if the maintainer did something untoward, like you know, checked in a bunch of code that was unverified, other people would seek to roll it back. And if it couldn't be rolled back, they'd start a new repository. And it, that's disconnected by, you know, lots of people looking and cross-checking in terms of converting the code into the binary. So if, if that didn't match, that would get caught too. So 
effectively it's it's very there's a lot of cross checks and no one person has the ability to you know surreptitiously change the code of the binary um, and so really that's that's the kind of technical thing and then the you know the level above that is who runs it and so there's in in other technologies there are kind of technical there's a kind of pyramid of information transmission where you've got specialists who understand the level details and then they talk to let's say the technology media that writes in a, in a, an exposition or explainer about something that's coming like taproot they explain it mm. and then you know so then if if the person who's not very technical says oh i hear there's an upgrade there's somebody within their reach or some quality media publication that covers that kind of thing like Aaron van Verdem's summary of it for example and so that that kind of um, pyramid of information disposal and quality of information builds up over time. So I think for it's much better today than it was even in you know 2015, 2017. So that helps mm. because you know not everybody's going to have the computer science expertise to understand something. So they need to know effectively they need to know who to trust to right. form an opinion. And that person may be asking somebody even more down in the mm. code or something. Well, how does that really work? Right. I was going to ask you how authority functions and or is different from a meritocracy, right? I think a lot of people have heard, you know, Bitcoin development, you know, functions like that. And uh, maybe you could try to illustrate, I guess, you know, what the difference between those those kind of models are or if there is a difference. Um, well, I, th I think the one, so it's a, it's a bit ITF-like in working by technical consensus, which generally means that, um, of course, there, there are these kind of immutable aspects of the system, so nobody would even typically propose changing them. But if they did, they would, you know, it would get rejected in many, many aspects of the system, including the investors and the end users and so on. And then within that, to achieve a particular optimization or opt-in improvement, there will be alternative ways to achieve each thing with different trade-offs. And then the technical consensus approach is that you would look for everybody to agree, or at least not disagree. And uh, you know, so if there, if there was a a uh, a knack like a, a disagreement with a valid technical rationale, like people say, well, it's true that is a a problem with that approach, and that that was a showstopper for that reason, then people would try and find another solution. Basically, so that's mm. that's the idea. So it's not you know, it's not a vote like. You know, there are the three approaches and one has more votes. It's not really like that. If, if people can't find a, a way forward that is acceptable in terms of the trade-offs, then it tends to take longer. And so you get this kind of trade-off between uh, speed of execution and, you know, doing the right thing in terms of, uh, you know, the way that opt-in features are architected for safety, I think it's in general. Mm -hmm. Try to move on a little bit to talk about it, influence Satoshi on the project and just kind of you know zooming out a little bit, um, you know his place in just cryptography and and, and technology. Um, you know Satoshi's been gone for ten years. We can now go back and, and kind of look at his work with some distance. Uh, do you think Satoshi Nakamoto is still influential in Bitcoin development today? Hmm. Well, I, I mean, as far as we know, right, nobody's heard from him in. Uh, that many years, so I mean the I, guess, I mean the you know the body of work, right? The the what he's left behind, like is the idea of him still influential today? I mean, I think it's. I mean, actually, I think it's better that people take take ownership for their own decisions and you know think for themselves about like. And actually, I think it's it's interesting and useful for the the technical you know quite far down in the code in terms of how it's architected, how the network communicates. So things that don't change the immutable parts of the system, but that can optimize and improve the system to re-examine like how things work once in a while, just to make sure that, you know, everybody didn't miss something obvious that would make it faster or something like that. So I think that, um, that it's more important that people have a technical rationale for why they're doing things and that they understand for themselves why the system should be immutable, why it should be decentralized. Because, you know, falling back to an argument that, well, Satoshi said this on Bitcoin Talk Post once, um, 
it's not it's not a rationale, right? I mean, maybe Stoshi was wrong in that instance. Like, who knows, right? Um, so it's it's a better test to say, is that why 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 should it do that? Um, you know, to form an understanding about what's what's important about Bitcoin. I think you know if you get into circular arguments, it's usually because there's a different understanding about what the goals in the system are, and that's that's hard to pin down because. Bitcoin has so many interesting things, but there are some things that I think are, you know, widely uh, understood. Like the fact that it's bearer, that the transactions are final, that it's 21 million coins, that they're emitted on this basis, that there's a work function. So there's, there's a bunch of things that people are just, you know, nobody's going to accept those changing ever. Um, mm. And so, you know, if, but you have to work through from those assumptions what that means so you know clearly that's what i was saying earlier that you can improve the system in some ways but then you'll make it worse in other ways and so that's that's where it gets interesting basically so i think the system is actually remarkably well optimized and there's not you know there's not that much prospect of a sudden breakthrough to make it you know 10 times right. cheaper 10 times this 10 times that there's a there's a trade-off so you know the the other, the other argument is, you know, you have Bitcoin layer twos that that make trade offs, mm. and you might say, well, if if a layer two can do it, um, why doesn't Bitcoin already do it? Like, why isn't it already in the main chain? Mm. And the, and the point is, it it can't because it's making a trade off, right? So it's maybe, you know, less secure or less decentralized or requires you to be online or requires your keys to be online or so there's there'll be some trade-off right which mm. which won't be optimal for people that want the core properties of you know cold storage censorship resistant permissionless um but they make that but they're great for some use cases which like let's say with lightning faster payments immediately final uh, more scalable for those kind of payments so i think you know the future generally is uh, layer twos that I mean, c continual sort of optimization and improvement of layer one, but uh, different trade-offs that positively compete in layer twos. Mm. So he lives on in the assumptions, right? So it sounds like you're saying the assumptions of the system were the essentially the aspects that are fixed by him or them. And, and, and to the extent that Satoshi is influential, it's, it's, it's merely in those sort of mathematical assumptions and the, and the, and the part of the code that, that can't be adjusted in that way. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, past a certain point, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not actually good to, um, well, I, I made this point that, you know, if Satoshi came back, I think I would argue that we should not give their opinions more weight than the next person, or that could become dangerous. Now, hmm. we have to assume that Satoshi is not coming back because it's been 10 years and you know, it seems like they did a very good job of keeping their privacy. And that seems to be an intentional thing, right? To tell a few people that he was leaving. But as a thought exercise, we are not treating the system as a decentralized system. If there's one specific person that could be charismatic or historically influential and put at risk of the properties of the system or, you know, change behavior about what the right technical trade-offs are. Mm. If Satoshi stayed, do you think that the network would have evolved differently? Would it have been necessary for us to remove him at some point for Bitcoin to be Bitcoin? Hmm. I'm, I'm you know, I mean, we don't know, but it, it could be the awareness of this kind of issue was part of the decision to step back. Um, another one could have been just like operational security, right? I think the longer you would sort of keep operating some anonymity technology, eventually your chances of making a mistake increase. So at some point if systems bootstrapped, maybe they should stop <laughs> and you know make choose a different email address or something. Um, but yeah, I think uh, it's it's a good thing that uh, they that they step back. And if if it did continue with um, somebody sort of in a more central role, there are different open source models. So I I hope that there would have been the wisdom to, you know, move in this kind of more decentralized 
and careful approach. Um, so Would I mean, that still have been Bitcoin to you, right? Like we have this idea of a Bitcoin sort of centralization, meaning developer decentralization. Would that have still been Bitcoin if, if Satoshi was around and, and, he, and he was still here operating as maybe as he was? Yeah, I mean, I think so, but it would it would be an overhang, right? You know, the media would be trying to uh, mainstream media tends to sort of. Um, you think he would be celebrity? He'd be on the top. Yeah, I mean, it kind of tends to sort of amplify, you know, what what does he have for breakfast kind of stuff, right? And want to do, you know, things like that, uh, which which is a bit odd for. Um, but, you know, internet protocols have famous people, right? Linux operating system has Linus Torvalds. Of course, he uh, self-describes himself as the uh, benevolent dictator for life, which is not, mm -hmm. not what we want in Bitcoin, in fact. But, you know, there are other open source projects that are have more distributed kind of technical community in a more consensus-like uh, approach. If you could ask Satoshi Nakamoto one question, what would you ask? Well, I am kind of curious as to how he arrived at some of the solutions. So particularly using the proof of work, both for creating new coins, which had been thought of before, but also as a tiebreaker in uh, kind of network race condition resolving. Because it's, it's sort of using the same thing like three or four times. And so I have my kind of pet theory, like maybe, maybe it, because the other, decentral, the other Byzantine general's solutions involve persistent identities. And there was a, an attempt to use Hashcash to make identities expensive to create. Um, so one theory is that you, if you combine those two things, you can arrive at it. So you know, for me, that's kind of backfitting. Like, well, those two pieces of technology went in about. And if you look at it in a certain way and then simplify it, that could explain how Bitcoin Bitcoin's kind of combined design came together, but I'm curious as to the, you know, the kind of um, evolution of the technologies came together. Hmm. Do you think Satoshi Nakamoto made any mistakes looking back? Was he was he wrong about anything? I mean, there were some like bugs and things. I mean, transaction malleability being the most recent kind of major one that was dealt with. I know that was a long running known issue, but it started to become increasingly a problem for uh, smart contract deployment. And there were some earlier bugs. I mean, they're, they're not really kind of design defects. I think there were some half-finished sort of ideas that didn't quite work out that, you know. Like merge know, mining uh, or something like that? Um, well, I think there was some kind of rudimentary lightning channel concepts with uh, sequence numbers that uh, maybe the game theory didn't quite work. And so I guess, I guess lightning kind of eventually solved some of those problems and you know, used a similar approach, but in a way that works properly for game theory. Mm. So there, there were sort of half-finished ideas in some of it, um, and 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 just code bugs that you know, opcodes that got disabled because they turned out to have security issues. Mm. Uh, Jameson Lop coming on la later for our uh, lightning round. He's got a saying. He says nobody understands Bitcoin. Uh, Adam Back, do you think Satoshi Nakamoto understood Bitcoin? Well, I think um, there are, you know, different levels of understanding and everybody's understanding is improving over time. But I think there are, you know, dozens of people who probably understand enough about the system and if given a year or two could re-implement, you know, something that behaves the same, basically. So, yeah, I think there are people that understand it enough to build the software, but I think the whole system is very interesting and, you know, individuals specializing in one area may not have as firm a grasp on, you know, the economics or the monetary policy, how, how monetary policy theory fits in with Bitcoin's economics or, you know, game theory and, uh, you know, what it is that causes um, us as users to give Bitcoin value. So there are lots of dimensions to it. And so, yeah, I think it's, it's a very interesting kind of complete system, which is, which is not just a piece of code, right? Hmm. All right, man. We got we got one more question for you uh, coming coming down to the end of the stream here on Satoshi Disappeared Day. Uh, so we're gonna hit you with another big one. Uh, just find these big questions kind of fun. <laughs> where, where do you think Satoshi Nakamoto ranks in terms of intellectual contributors to Bitcoin? Is he number one for you? Is he is he top five? Where where are you putting him? 
Oh yeah, number one because um, you know the you know if you look at Bitcoin as a design after it's built, you can understand it. But from first-hand experience, trying to make you know to achieve a similar effect with working with you know, from Hashcash onwards, it's uh, it's very hard to. You know, you're sort of fumbling around in the dark trying to find solutions. You don't know what the solutions should look like. The solution space is like nearly infinite. And then you find a solution, like so hash cache or something like that, right? And you know, when you when you finish, people say, Oh, that's obvious. You know, it's like, okay, you you, you try and repeat it, right? So mm. so the finished solution, like a, a simple, elegant solution, is deceptively hard to find. So I think, you know, assembling the pieces and making the game theory work. More than even more than the implementing it, like the concepts are, you know that I mean people are saying that he should get the, you know some kind of uh, prize like economic prize or technology prize, and I, I agree. I think that's uh, you know major contribution to hmm. economics and computer science. Adam, appreciate you coming on, and thanks for being here. Where can people find out more about uh, your work uh, and about what Blockstream is doing? I, that didn't sound as awkward in my head as it did when I said it, but because you're Adam, uh, where, yeah, where so. <laughs> So I'm on Twitter, Adam3US, and Blockstream's uh, Twitter as well, or blockstream.com, and we have a lot of stuff there. Cool, man. All right, well, appreciate you coming on. We'll have more great stuff here at Bitcoin Magazine. Satoshi Disappear Day. We're talking about the man, the myth, who started it all. Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, and, uh, of course, uh, appreciate you guys hanging out. Uh, please continue the stream on Twitter, YouTube, uh, LinkedIn. We're going out everywhere. Next up will be Mr. Matt O'Dell with a great panel talking about Satoshi's OPSEC, looking into how he has maintained his elusive identity to this day. Adam, appreciate you coming on. Uh, looking forward to seeing you soon and, and continuing the chat. And appreciate all your answers to today. Really great stuff. Thanks. That was fun. Bye.